us and ladies for playing is good. If you got a, a Bible with you, turn your Bibles to 2 Peter. 2 Peter, and we'll go to the very last verse as I've done now, last several weeks in a row. And now I am uh, just one week from finishing this series. I've got uh, next week to add charity to brotherly kindness, but today we'll add brotherly kindness to our faith. And I believe everything that leads up to this point in our, our growth is to get to these last two, the adding of brotherly kindness and the adding of charity. And they kind of go hand in hand, but they're a little bit different. We'll differentiate the two uh, between this week and next week. But if you've got your Bible with you, go into the very last verse of 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter number 3, look at verse number 18. The Bible says, But grow in grace, and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. I want us to consider a few different things. This is the last that we get to hear from Peter. Peter's the man who stuck up for Jesus and cut off the ear in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then Jesus had to go and, and fix that because I believe Jesus had a plan for Peter and going to prison for assaulting an officer probably wasn't in the cards for him. And so Jesus fixes that. But we look and we see Peter, the man who's willing to defend Christ. We see Peter, he's the one in Though it was, it was not right, and though it was contrary to God's will, when Jesus said, I'm going to go and when I get to Jerusalem, they're going to crucify me there. It was Peter who said, be it far from thee, Lord. And we know, looking back and hindsight being 2020, and being able to see the fulfillment of the Old Testament in Christ and see Jesus usher in a New Testament time, we have all that understanding. You go before that, though, and Peter just has a love for the, his Messiah a love for Christ that says, we don't want anything to happen to you. Peter had a love for Jesus. If you look and you consider Peter when uh, everybody's in the boat, everybody's scared, and Jesus comes walking on the water. Peter's the one that gets out of the boat. Peter had a love for Christ. Peter had a, a faith in Christ. He had a strength and a boldness about him. There's a lot about Peter that you look at and you think, boy, we, we should be more like Peter in a lot of ways. And then times where maybe we need more self-control, much like Peter did. But we see Peter and the relationship that he had with Christ, probably second to none. You had three disciples that were kind of inner circle, Peter, James, and John. They're the ones that got to see things that the, the other nine did not get to see. Then you have Peter, who is brought even closer than the other two of those three. And Peter, he writes these two books of the Bible, and he gives us that last verse telling us to grow in grace and then to the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. That's what he wants to leave all of the church with. Peter, he's signing off and he's giving his last bit of instruction, and that's the instruction that he gives. And when you consider then the heart of Peter that we can see in the Gospels, we can see this heart still transfers now in the last verse giving instruction to us, as Christians. Now, Peter doesn't just tell us to grow without telling us how. You go back to chapter number one, and we've seen it now these last six weeks. And now we'll add to it a seventh, and we'll add to it next week a, a eighth part in this. But back to chapter number one, he makes these statements starting in verse number five. Peter, he says, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. So Peter, he sums up the whole thing and says, let's get to know Jesus better. And then he says, if we want to act like Jesus and be like Jesus and, and grow in our knowledge of Jesus, he says, we're going to start here and we're going to move on over in our life. And there's a growth and a development that takes place. And I won't labor that point much because I've done so now six times already. And I recognize this is the seventh time that I've been here talking about these things. But the measure of a Christian in their growth are these eight things. It's not any other measure. When God looks at the measure of a Christian, he says, this is it. 
We have our faith, and we add to that a desire to do right, a, a moral goodness, a virtue. So we take our faith, we add to it virtue. We add to that virtue a knowledge, an understanding of what the Word of God says. Those are measures of Christian growth. And we add to that knowledge the idea of a temperance, a self-control. And from there, we add a patience, and we add a godliness, as we added last week. We look at where two weeks ago. We added two weeks ago this idea of a godliness, and now brotherly kindness. Brotherly kindness begins to be where we see the fruit of this growth, where we get to see it manifesting more in how we treat the people that are around us. We learn from the Word of God that when we have a brotherly kindness, the world then that is lost looks and is able to see a brotherly kindness. When the world looks at a Christian and says, I wonder if it's the real deal. The Bible tells us they know that from brotherly kindness. Now, I um, this last week we were down at that revival, and there was a group there uh, called Reckless Saints from Nowhere. And uh, this is a guy who was addicted to opioids at 13 years old because he got in an accident on a, a dirt bike and busted up his face. And they had to break the other half of his face to reconstruct something and rebuild his face. And way back then, he's the same age as I am. Uh, he is um, just two months older than I am. Uh, so we're the same age. And back in 2000, uh, 2000, 2001, or you go back even into the 90s, uh, the idea of giving people these, these narcotics was very easy, and it was given very freely. And at 13 years old, he was given these pain, pain meds. And this whole reconstruction thing was a long process, and by the time he's done, he's so addicted to these drugs, addicted to these pills. And then all of a sudden, if you can't get them in a, a legal way, you begin to get them in an illegal way, and next thing you know, there's all these other things that end up uh, offered to you. And when he finally got to the end of his line, where his life got to the absolute end of it, he had shot up heroin 16 times that day, 16 doses, 16 needles of heroin. And it came to an end because a federal officer was there and he attacks this federal officer with a deadly weapon. And so all of this comes to him. Now he's a pastor's kid. His brother is also a pastor. He wasn't going down this road of destruction. He was just a kid who broke his face and ended up addicted to these things, and it takes him down this course in life. Now he's going, and his whole ministry is bringing people uh, from, from the spot of right before they go into prison, offering an alternative, hey, send them to rehab. And then they, they end up going this direction instead of prison. They have such a great success rate, and it's a great story. But it's interesting to me that the world receives that very well. Because when you consider the amount of money he saves, he went to the, the state of Oklahoma and he built this thing up in Oklahoma. And the reason it's reckless saints from nowhere is because they were in this city and this city is no longer a city. So they were from this place and now it's no longer officially a city because it's so small. So they say they're from nowhere because it has just become nowhere. But they went into the state of Oklahoma and they saved hundreds of millions of dollars to the state by running this program. Now, Ohio State has called them. Other states have called them. And the world says, wow, we can save some money going through this type of a program. And he's got this whole thing. He's autistic. He, he thinks a different way. And he reads all these very smart man. But he came up with a plan that is very successful, saves all this money. So the world says, how do we do this? And states are calling saying, let's plug this in. Let's figure this out. And the only resistance that he's gotten it's from Christian people. I mean, imagine that. It's Christian people. There's a big organization. I won't say what organization it is because it's not my intent to just run down these different groups. But they wanted to purchase so that to give them all this money, $500,000, so they could attach their name to it. And he says, I, I don't want to do that. And then there's all kinds of strife then and attack from that group. There's another church that wanted to take over the thing and attach their name to it because it's successful. And then there's a resentment now for not doing it that way. He goes into different places and he's too conservative for some. He's not conservative for others. And uh, some will beat him up for using this Bible version. Some will beat him up for using that Bible version. It's all a, a strife and a fight. And he says the only resistance he gets 
it's from Christian people. I was talking to my, my wife, and uh, there's people who do not like me very much. There's people who don't like Brandon Jorgensen. Every single one of them claims Christ. Every one of them. There's probably not a person that I can think I can't think of anybody if I knocked on their door and they were the type of person that would welcome people into their homes and they were lost. I can't think of a lost person that does not like me. Can't think of one. I can't think of a lost person who I have strife with. There's none. But there are Christian people who don't want to talk to Brandon Jorgensen for all kinds of different reasons. Whether justified or not, that's not the point. But the point is, where there is strife, it seems to be prevalent within churches. And that ought not be the case. And I believe that there's a, a strife that is there because there's seeds planted. There's an adversary that we have. There's an accuser of the brethren. And I believe that accuser of the brethren has his fiery darts. He, he puts these things into our heart and a resentment against Christians. Some of it, I believe, is a, a matter of pride. But when we look and there is strife, consider that yourself. Somebody who has strife with you or somebody you have strife with, are they a believer or are they a lost person? Maybe I don't engage with lost people enough. I don't know. But for me, the biggest strife, brothers in Christ. Why is that? We look and we're going to learn here an aspect of growing as a Christian. And I believe we get to this point in our growth and we struggle with the idea of a brotherly kindness. So now there's strife. We struggle with a brotherly kindness. So now there's a, a resentment of Christian people. And I believe you can look back at that line and somewhere along the line, we have lost virtue. We've lost a knowledge or an understanding. We've lost our patience with each other. We've lost a temperance to temper our anger, to temper the resentment, to temper the works of the flesh in our life. But somewhere along the line, Christian people fail before they get to brotherly kindness. And we fail at brotherly kindness just the same. Now let's look, look 1 John chapter number 4, just a couple pages over. 1 John chapter number 4, it's probably four or five turns for you. The Bible tells us 1 John chapter number 4, and we're going to look at verse number 7. 1 John chapter number 4, verse number 7. Travis, good to see you. The Bible says, verse number 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Now, I've been talking on Sunday nights, balancing truth and love, and I'm going to talk about that uh, briefly this morning also as I go into these one another passages. Love is, is not always just keeping our mouth shut and being nice. Sometimes love looks different than that. But the Bible says that faithful are the wounds of a friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I'd rather wake up in the morning and have my wife say, you don't have any pants on, where are you going? Than to say, I love you. I mean, imagine that. That's not the love of my wife. My wife would say, you know. So my wife takes that a step further and goes, those are too wrinkly. Those don't match. Those are, <laughs> I'm kidding. But anyway, uh, we look and love is this idea of telling the truth. That's what God did. Now let's go on. God is love, verse 9. For in this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us, and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, listen to this last part, we ought also to love one another. We ought also to love one another. Jump down to verse number 20. The Bible says, If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. Let's back up just a moment here. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. That's very strong. That's very strong. I felt very strong this week when I was talking to these release time kids. There's 22 kids looking at me. And one of them is playing with a chair. 
And I won't tell you who it is, but uh, Todd told him to turn his hat around. It was just, just something there. But anyway, uh, he's playing with this chair. And he's kicking this chair and all these different things. And there's a girl that's supposed to be sitting in that chair. And her chair keeps getting kicked and different things. And I said, hey, don't touch the chair. And he goes, I did it. <laughs> I said, I said, do you think I'm an idiot? And he goes, yes. I mean, imagine that. Even Isaiah. Isaiah, who sometimes gives me a hard, you know Isaiah can give you a hard time. Isaiah, anybody in here who's taught a class, or taught a class, uh, knows Isaiah can give you a hard time. And Isaiah looks over and goes, oh, like that to this kid. But I remember in that class, and I started asking some questions. And I said, how many of you, how many of you pay for everything you've ever bought or everything you have? How many of you paid for it and nobody's ever given you anything? Because I was talking about honoring mother and father. Uh, talking about a goose and what a goose will do to protect their children. And we, we learned that just, they'll just die to protect these eggs, just die for it. I told the story how uh, there was a late spring uh, snow. And so it was supposed to be this nice time. They all laid their eggs. This blizzard came. And uh, all these geese, hundreds of them, as the snow melted, they saw all these geese, the geese and the, gan the goose and the gander there. And the snow just came and their head just got taller as they were trying to just breathe, and none of them got up. None of them. All of the eggs that they found as that snow melted had a goose sitting on it. And that snow came up above their head, and every one of them died. And I said, now your parents, every single one of you, regardless of the situation, your parents have cared for you because nobody gets to release time without somebody having sacrificed to get you there. Nobody dressed themselves the day they were born. Nobody fed them. Nobody kept them warm. And uh, I had these kids, and they were claiming that they were self-sufficient. And I said, y'all are liars. You're liars. And you could see the look in their face when I just pointed right at them and said, you're a liar. And they're like, you just called me a liar. But they knew it was true. And we look here in God now. We ought to stand before God as his kids. And God has pointed a finger at us. And though we can be goofing like these release time kids, goofing, having fun, rolling on the floor like Landon does. I mean, it's something. Uh, rolling on the floor, the, the goofing the whole time. But when you get serious with it and you point a finger right at their face, you say, you're lying. You're a liar. Boy, the, you're calling me a liar. We ought to have that same response. So I hope that we don't behave as immaturely as the kids do in release time. But I sure hope that when somebody points a finger and says, you're lying, we take it as seriously as they do. Because though we might not be as immature, we run through life oftentimes and correction comes and that correction lands right on our shoulders and we brush that off because nobody likes to be corrected. But God just pointed a finger at us and I ought to look at my own life. If I say, I love God, if I can identify in my life Somebody who goes to church, somebody who goes not even to this church, but another church or a church a long ways away or a, a pastor somewhere or a Christian brother somewhere. If I can look and I can find that I hate somebody who claims Christ, God just says, I cannot say that I love him and hate my brother. Because if I do, the Bible says I am a liar. Now I will one day stand before God. Every word that I say, every idle word that is spoken, everything done in my body, whether it be good or whether it be evil, is going to be judged as the books are open and I stand before God at a judgment seat of Christ and my works are tried through the fire, the wood, hay, the stubble, all of that. I'll stand before God and give an account for what I do. I would rather make sure now that if God points a finger at me and says, I'm a liar, because there's strife between me and a brother. I'd rather deal with that now, because one day I have to deal with it no matter what. I'm going to deal with it by judging my own life, and the Bible teaches. There's a principle that oftentimes Christians, sometimes they, they, they don't understand it. But the Bible teaches me that if I judge myself, God doesn't have to judge me if I judge myself. So if in this life I say, okay, God's calling me a liar, I want to deal with that, let's address that, and then I judge that myself, then I can stand before God and not be judged for that because I judged it myself. Just like if I woke up one morning and the kids 
their room was a mess. They're supposed to keep their room, room clean. Dad doesn't have to come and say, clean your room, if they get up and do it themselves. You know, if they start fighting, and then all of a sudden, in the middle of fighting, before they're ever caught out, or before they're ever, before it's realized by their mom or their dad, if they're fighting, if they ever stopped and said, you know what, we shouldn't be fighting, I'm sorry. And the other one said, yeah, we shouldn't be fighting, I'm sorry. There's no involvement with me. They've already judged it themselves. I don't show up and say, hey, quit fighting, and they go, we did. We're already hugging each other. There'd be no judgment because judgment had already happened. In this life, when God calls me a liar, I ought to be able to look at my life and recognize I'll stand before God as a liar and be judged there, or I'll stand right here and acknowledge that I need to judge it myself and fix it. And I encourage us to do so. But God tells us, if we say we love him, but we hate our brother, whether it's in our heart, whether it manifests somehow, or whether we just harbor that, I believe we've got to deal with that and address those things. There's a few verses. I was going to turn to them in my Bible, but I already recognize I'm running out of time, and I've got single verses that I'd like to go to, so I'm going to go through uh, more quickly. And you don't have to turn there. These are just one another Bible verses. This is not something I've never covered before. I talk about this often because I believe it is incredibly important for the health and the unity of a church examining the one another passages. But the Bible tells us we are to receive one another. Receive one another. And not only does it say we are to receive one another, but we are to receive one another as Christ received us. So when we examine how our relationship is with the brethren, how our relationship is with other Christians, I believe first and foremost we look and we see how are we received? How do we receive others? And how did Jesus receive us? Remember the Bible says in Romans chapter number 5 verse number 8, but God commendeth his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners... Christ died for us. Jesus was willing to receive us when we were at our lowest spot. Jesus never, ever said, you know what? This guy's pretty low. If he can climb halfway out of that hole, I'll meet him in the middle and I will save him. I'll receive him. That's never the case. Jesus came to die for sinners. The Apostle Paul said he came and died for the Apostle Paul. And he's a sinner and not only a sinner, but the cheapest of sinners. The Apostle Paul claimed that on himself through the leadership of the Holy Spirit. But we look, and if I'm to receive somebody like Jesus does, you receive them where they are. You don't make them jump through a series of hoops in order for there to be a receiving. You don't take somebody who's offended you and make them apologize just the right way. Boy, the wording of that was was good enough. They worded it good, and that was enough time ago that maybe enough time has passed. You worded it a certain way. There was a look in your eye. I knew there was enough contrition in you. I'll receive it. That's not what Jesus did. And if that's not what Jesus did, that's not how we ought to receive. We're to receive each other like Jesus did. And Jesus was open-armed from the lowest spot. And the Bible says that he loved us before we loved him. We are supposed to be like Christ in that. And that if there is a broken relationship, we ought to say first, I'm willing to restore this. Even before that person is willing to restore. That's hard. It's much easier. Somebody comes in and says, boy, I messed up. Can we get along? Let's put these things behind us. Now you're sitting here looking at somebody who wants to make it right. And you think, how many loops should they jump through? Is this good enough? And then we make that decision. But Jesus didn't do that. You have a person who hates you. And Jesus says, receive the person who hates you, because that's what he did. That's what he did. That's tough, but that's how God tells us to receive one another. We look, and I mentioned that guy, uh, Brother Jordan from um, uh, Reckless Saints from Nowhere. No opposition except churches. I mean, think about that. He's doing a good thing. I was impressed by the ministry. I was impressed by him as a person but the resistance comes from Christians. That ought not be the case. Let's move on. We're to receive one another. The Bible says in Galatians 5.13, For brethren, ye are called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion of the flesh, but by love serve one another. Serve one another. I believe if we are to challenge ourselves and be honest and say, boy, we, we want to be good brethren. We want to take care of each other as we ought to. Think about in your life. Look back at the last week. Can you think of in the last seven days of an example where there's a Christian brother or sister who needed something and you served them? 
I mean, think about it. When you think back then, if you can't come up with one in a week, how about a month? What have you done this year in service to somebody? When's the last time you knew somebody had a need and you went, you weren't looking for money, you weren't looking for applause, you weren't trying to stand up in front of the whole church and say what it is that you did so you can lift yourself up. You just wanted to be helpful. Because if you cannot look back and say, well, I had an opportunity to do this, and then I had an opportunity to do this, and you can look back and see these opportunities that God gave you, that you took advantage of and was a servant to others. If you can't come up with them, reason tells me we're not serving each other as we ought to. That's an indictment against us. If we want to grow as a Christian, we've got faith, we add to it virtue. We add to virtue knowledge. We add to knowledge a temperance, a patience. We add a brotherly a godliness and then a brotherly kindness. It's a measure of growth. If you have grown as a Christian, you should be able to look at your life and say, I'm serving people here. I'm serving people here. And if you're lacking it, it's the challenge of your heart today to go to God and say, God, I need to be serving more than I am. Help me to know how to do that. Another one, the Bible says we're to be forgiving one another and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, hath forgiven you. Is there somebody who's offended you and you're not willing to forgive? I know I kind of alluded to that already with the receiving. But if somebody's offended you, somebody said something, somebody did something, and you're holding it hostage, we've got to let that go. Jesus never does that with me. Jesus has never done that with you. Jesus doesn't do that with anybody. Let's be forgiving one another. We go on. The Bible tells us we're to be edifying one another. Let us, therefore, follow after the things which make for peace and the things wherewith one may edify another. I teach the word edification to uh, young kids sometimes, and I talk to teenagers, the idea of edification. You, you give a, you're given an assignment from your English teacher to write out a report, or you, you know, give me 500 words on whatever, blah, 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 blah. You get it back, and it's got a C minus up there, because I was never very good at that kind of stuff. C minus up there, and then that's a run-on. That's a fragment. That's a run-on. That's a fra Run-ons and fragments are tough. Then there's supposed to be a comma here. This is supposed to be a period. You got your quotations in the wrong place, and this is spelled wrong. This is redundant. This should be a new paragraph. They go through, and there's all the problems with it. And we should be, as people, wise enough and gracious enough to receive something like that and go, okay, all of that helps me. All of that is good for me. If I'm spelling this word wrong, it's good that somebody shows up and says, that's not spelled right, so that you can then spell it the right way. And every teacher I've ever had, if they cross something out, put a little SP next to it, over in the margin they say, this is how it's spelled, and they'll spell it out. That's an opportunity to learn and to grow. The idea of being edified then, the teacher shows up and says, there's 42 things wrong with this. And hopefully that's not in a 100-word report. But you look and there's 42 things wrong with this. You should go, now wait a minute. I'm going to receive all of that instruction so I can grow. It can strengthen me. I'm wiser. I'm better. I, I am a more matured person having received that. And the Bible tells us as Christians, we're supposed to be that same way. Now, if we have a maturity, a Christian friend should be able to come and the wounds of a friend, the wounds of a friend should have such great value to us because somebody is willing to speak the truth. So we learn two things from that. If a Christian comes to you and offers you some advice, if it is done in a good spirit, we should receive it with a good spirit as edification. And then secondly, if we see wrong in somebody else or an opportunity to be helpful in a certain area, a brother goes and does those things. You should never be afraid to come to your pastor and say, I don't think this is being done the right way. Because one of three things is going to happen. A, I'll tell you why we do it the way we do it, and you'll go, oh, that makes perfect sense. Or you'll tell me why it's wrong, and I'll go, oh, that, that makes perfect sense. And I will, I'll learn from that. But if we do it those ways, one of those things is going to happen. We can gain an understanding. Or three, one of us is going to be offended. And that's not how it ought to be. But the Bible tells us we're to be edifying one another. So if edification comes your way, we're supposed to receive that. The Bible tells us we're to bear one another's burdens. I know I'm running out of time. 
Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. The Bible says, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. The Bible tells us to exhort one another daily. Exhort one another daily. Exhortation is an encouragement to do what is right. An exhortation is encouraging somebody to a moral goodness. If somebody's trying to do something and uh, maybe there's failure there, but they're doing better than they once did, exhortation is you're doing a good job. Exhortation is you can do this thing. Exhortation is God's going to be there with you. Can I pray with you? Can I help you through these things? Exhortation is an encouragement forward. Uh, we did a, a coloring contest this week. Uh, we sat down in front of the, the TV. We got all these TV trays, and this guy got up, and he's an animator for Disney. He was going to teach us how to do Olaf. And uh, if you watch a professional artist draw Olaf, it doesn't look anything like Olaf at first. They draw these shapes and these goofy things, but all my kids right down the line, my wife, I made her the judge, and uh, obviously I won. But anyway, uh, we look, and, and you encourage them. Now, my kids, uh, they want to just do the job, and so they just draw the picture, and it's done. And I took a long time, like half an hour into my picture of all it's shaded, and uh, so they, they think, well, obviously, you're going to win, and they think it's because I'm older. And I've done some drawing in the past. But in reality, I told them, it's because all of you are done. You just, you just scribbled through it. And I said, I've taken a long time on this. I've edited and I've worked on it. I've taken all this time. And I put the time into it. Then I encourage my kids, when you write somebody a letter, take your time with it. Uh, maybe start a letter. Draw through the lines. And I said, you know how nice you write when it's penmanship time and uh, you're trying to get a grade? If you look at what they, do, what they do for penmanship, it looks so good. And then everything else looks like garbage. I mean, it really does. The penmanship is so bad. But I said, you just take your time with it. And they've got some friends that they want to pen pal back and forth. And I said, you know, how much, how much is your friend worth? You know, you think this friendship is really important. Take some time with it. You know, sit down and really think about what you want to say and pretend it's penmanship class. And then leave the letter. And then go about your day and continue thinking about some things to say and then come back uh, to the letter and write some more in the letter. Give it some good substance and quality. And then when they open up that letter, they'll think, wow, this person really took some time and some thought into this letter. Well, anyway, uh, I did that coloring contest. I came back the next day. So this would have been yesterday I got home. And the Olafs look way better. And I'm looking at the Princess, Princess Anna. And I'm thinking, this is the best picture I've ever seen. Uh, Madison draw. And Reagan's got this Anna, and I'm thinking, that's the best picture I've ever seen her draw. Now, Thursday, let's see, get my days mixed up. This has been Friday. We had that competition. They ran through it. And I said, you can do a good job. You just got to take some time. That's edification, telling them they've got to do better in this area. That's exhortation, telling them you can do a better job at this. If you slow down, you take your time, you can do a good job. And I saw the best pictures I've ever seen from my kids. A little bit of edification, a little bit of exhortation. Now, why in the world do Christians, instead of taking time to edify one another, receiving each other as sinners like Jesus received us, why aren't we edifying and exhorting one another to do right? How we really behave is we look at somebody's picture we compare it to our own, and boy, they really failed at that. They're half the Christian I am. They can't do anything right. That's how we often behave. We often behave that way. And we look and we see there's a reason it gets all the way to number seven. Because in order to exercise brotherly kindness right, there's a lot of growth that takes place. And the reason God adds that after all those other things is because it is so incredibly important, but we also have to be mature enough to add that to our faith. We look and we see the value of a church. I believe the value of a church is going to be determined by these last two. The value of our church will be judged, I believe, by God, by the brotherly kindness that we're able to show each other and the charity that we'll talk about next week. How we treat each other and how we treat everybody else. That's the judgment that comes to our church. That's the value of our church or the vanity and uselessness of it. I want to be a church that accomplishes great things. I want to be a church that grows 
and doesn't split in half every handful of years like so many churches do and like our church has done. Let's look to a future, and if our future can have this growth that takes place, if our future can have brotherly kindness and our future has charity, I promise you our church does not split in half. Our church does not hate each other. Our church does not call each other liars and split and run off someplace else. We'll work together in unity. But all of those things are a challenge to our own heart, and we've got to deal with it. I'm going to close in a word of prayer. I believe Anna, Miss Anna has offering today, or an invitation today because she did offer it. I encourage you to talk to God this morning. A couple of those things. The Bible calls us a liar if we hate our brother. The Bible tells us we're to receive one another as Jesus received us. The Bible tells us we're to be forgiving one another, tenderhearted. Is there anybody in your life that you don't think you have a good relationship with, but they're a brother in Christ? They're a sister in Christ. They go to church here or someplace else. We've got to take our hearts to God and say, God, I want to judge myself for that today rather than waiting to be judged for it later. If there's a bitterness towards any Christian, let's deal with that this morning and allow God to add next week charity to a brotherly kindness that is where it should be. As Miss Anna plays. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. We ought to come to church and we ought to live our life not just thinking about our own selves, but considering those that are around us. And in doing so, it provokes others to good works also. I believe that's a very important part of a church growing and a church doing what is right. And I'm thankful for everybody that came out this morning. It's good to be back in Elkton. It's good to be able to preach here. At, uh, at home. Uh, it's good to have a few visitors with us, some returning and some uh, brand new first time today. And so it was good to see the visitors here also and thankful for all them kids. Uh, some of them are here without parents and uh, they come to our Wednesday programs. It's good to see them added to our Sunday program. Uh, sometimes it's rough, but it's good to see kids. And so let's go ahead and we'll close the, the service out in a word of prayer and hope you all enjoy your enjoy your afternoon. Let's go ahead and we'll pray. Lord, I thank you for an opportunity to gather together. I thank you for the word, the challenge that it gives us. And Lord, the word does not shy away from speaking the truth to us. The word of God is willing to call us liars. The word of God is willing to call us all kinds of different things. But Lord, I believe the word of God does those things so that we can have a willingness to look at our hearts and to be willing to grow to address some things that maybe we don't want to address. 
Well, Lord, I pray that you would help us as a church and help us as individuals to love each other as we ought to, to examine our own hearts and to move forward unified together so that when we get to next week and we talk about the idea of adding charity, our church can get busy about the work that you'd have us to do, loving the world that's around us. Lord, I pray you'd bless our week. Keep us safe. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed this morning.